This is the first session, so it's just an intro. We're just going to work our way through the syllabus so you can learn a little bit about the format. You can ask any questions you want. If your questions are specifically about angels, demons, spiritual warfare, angel of the Lord, uh, you can save those for later. <laughs> <laughs> because uh, this is, again, this how the class works, the intro, and you probably also want dates. So we're going to work through that as well. But before we jump in and get started, I would like to pray with you. If somebody... It's kind of interesting. We have 55 people signed up. We distributed uh, syllabi to everybody who signed up, and yet I still ran out of the extra 10 that I printed up today. So if you need one for next time, please let us know. We'll have some more produced for next the next time we meet, which is not next week, but in two weeks. And uh, I'd like to pray with you and get started. Father, we thank you for your word, and it communicates to us so much about not only how we are saved and who you are, but also the spiritual battle that is going on around us and the, the comforts and resources you bring, as well as the struggles that we can have with uh, the, the demonic realm, with Satan, our enemy. And to know about him is to be able to be prepared to, to engage in combat and to be successful in living our Christian lives. So we would help us. We would ask you to help us focus on that which we should be and not worry about that which we shouldn't. Because when we look forward, we can, we can press on looking for the genuine thing in you and in your word and not be deceived, which is the chief tool of the enemy. So help us to understand what is going on. Thank you for everybody that's here. We pray for those who didn't make it today, but will make it in the future. And we lift you up in Jesus' name. Amen. So let me do some housekeeping first and foremost. If you have, first of all, uh, does everybody bring a pen? Okay, if you if you didn't, then it's going to be harder for you to write things down, just just so you're aware. And we do have extra pens out in the lobby in a little jar out there if you ever need it. And you, the thing you'll be able to write down today is the dates that we are meeting. This basically meets every other week until the first week in December with one extra week added in for Labor Day weekend in September. So let me read those dates to you and let's, let's start talking about that. Um, we are here for Angelology, the study of angels and demons. And here in our introductory session at the Mountain View School of Theology, we want you to be, oh, look at that, that's, that's terrible. There we go. Um, aware of the dates. So first date, if you have your pages open, you can see the, the, the lessons everybody got looking at their syllabus. Page five, thank you very much. Um, our dates, today's date is 6-9. We'll also meet on 6-23, that's in two weeks. And then 7-7, seven, seven, July 7th, 7-21, uh, August 4th, August 18th, September 8th. So there's an extra week there because we're skipping over Labor Day, September 8th, September 22nd. October 6th, October 20th, November 3rd, November 17th, and December 8th. Now, which of those do you need me to repeat? November. November 11, 3 and 11, 17. Anybody else? Any other dates that need to be repeated? The other thing that I'm going to ask is that we, oh, shucks. Shucks, I was looking for the sign-up sheet. I didn't bring it with me. Um, our, our office staff, uh, I'm going to put, if you signed up and you put your email down, great, great. If you're here and you haven't gotten your email to us, we would like to have it because each week that we meet, the office staff will send out a reminder email to you. Um, now, sometimes we know that ends up going in a junk mail if there's a long list or something of that nature. But if you want the email reminders, uh, here's a sheet, and you can put your email address down on it if you want. So, okay, if you did it, then just pass it on. If, if you want it or want to make sure, put it down. Uh, how many of you have taken classes with me before? Okay, so you know the torture you're in for. And uh, the, the rest of you, I hope that you find it enjoyable. We do have a interactive class. There's a lot of information to put forward to you. 
Um, I have no compunction whatsoever. I don't never feel a need to reinvent the wheel. So in, if it's someplace you feel, I've heard that quote, or I've heard that said in a similar way. Uh, please don't be surprised for a couple of reasons. One, we're all talking about the same subject, so we're liable to say the same things. The other thing is if I find a good quote from another author, I'm just telling you upfront, I, I took quotes from other authors. So uh, don't, please don't check me and, and look to bring me up on charges of plagiarism. I'm telling you upfront, we, we quote from other guys all the time and I'm probably not gonna cite, make a citation for every quote. So I'm just being upfront with you on that. The other thing that we want you to know is that we are interactive. If you have a question, please raise your hand and we're all gonna get to know each other to some degree or another. And uh, just tell me what your question is. I will try and answer it or I will say that's coming up in a future session because oftentimes we start looking at information. Was, well, that, that keyed me a question to something else. Well, that's coming up next time or in a couple of times from then. So I want you to be aware of that and I entertain questions. The classes have always heard me say, the only question that I don't wanna hear is the one, the, the one you didn't ask. I want you to ask your questions and it may seem foolish. It may even be, and some of us, I'm guilty of this sometimes. I'll sit in a class, um, just so you know. Um, my, my academic history is that I actually went to public school, graduated from high school, went on to a community college, got an associates in business management, went to grad, not grad school, but undergraduate school and from Eastern Oregon State University, got a degree in business communication, moved on to Western Seminary, got a, a master's with a dual major in counseling and in theology, and then have since acquired two different uh, doctoral uh, degrees simply because I was interested in learning. Um, those are simply the, the ways that I've uh, experienced learning about things, and I don't hold put a lot of stock in degrees. If you see somebody say, oh, I'm Dr. So-and-so, what that really means is they know a lot about this little sliver of life. <laughs> so you can ask me anything you want about theology. I'll try and give a reasonable answer, but if you ask me something about mechanics, I'm gonna refer you to my mechanic uh, because I know uh, a fair amount about certain things and not much about others. And just a word of caution, so you know, uh, some people sit in class, and they hear me say I dual uh, tracked in seminary of my master's and got counseling and theology and say, oh, counseling. I am not a counselor. I will sit down with people a couple of times and do some pastoral biblical work, but if you need therapy, we're gonna refer you to someone else. So a lot of times people say, oh, I wanna counsel with you. If I took time to counsel with everybody in the congregation, we'd have trouble. So we do biblical counseling. We encourage our staff to do that and to not get in over our heads. Recently, somebody asked me about a, a situation. I said, I don't, I'm not an expert in that area. I cannot help somebody in that area. So please be aware of that. We, we all stay in our lanes. Uh, questions or comments thus far? Good. We will continue to move forward. Uh, how many of you are interested in spiritual warfare? I, I, good, good to know, because you're in the right class then. But sometimes we've spent looking, our time spending looking at literature that is not necessarily theology. This present darkness. Piercing the Darkness by Frank Peretti. Sometimes we, we have gotten books on spiritual warfare. What we wanna do is we wanna stay biblically based here in our class. You understand that Frank Peretti's work is fiction. In meeting Frank, it was an interesting time because he goes, I'm a storyteller. I'm telling stories and I'm trying to incorporate biblical principles, but please don't take my books as gospel. Good to know. Randy Alcorn's book on heaven, don't take it as gospel. He is very clear that there's times he's speculating there. Um, we want to be upfront and honest when we say, this is what scripture says, here's a couple of interpretations. You're gonna have to make some decisions. For instance, we will have a lengthy discussion on whether or not uh, people can be possessed and can Christians be possessed because there are two sides of that equation in uh, amongst theologians, whether a Christian can or cannot be possessed. And the, the word possessed and the word oppressed are no longer even the cutting edge terms in theology anymore. We talk about demonization not as much about oppression and um, um, possession as we used to. So we'll try and keep everybody up to date and give you a good 
understanding of what scripture says to the best of our knowledge. But I also make no apologies for the fact that I'm teaching this class. And while I will try and share all the positions with you, if you ask me to answer a question, I will be giving you my understanding of scripture. And if it's a controversial issue, I'll try and give the other side its fair due, but I'll also let you know this is where I stand. And I am not infallible. Lest you think differently, I, trust me, I'm not infallible. You can add, you get my wife's phone number. I'm good with that. All right. So let's take a look just at the first part. Now, uh, I suspect, as in most classes, I only have one person taking the, the course for credit. And uh, he is hiding right now behind the, the, uh, the desk. Uh, Thomas is our youth pastor, and he has been pursuing his advanced degree through Mount View School of Theology. And so he will be subject to tests and to papers and to presentations. If you are here and numbers of people ask me, it says, I don't think I can do the papers or, or do the present. It's okay. You don't have to. If you're auditing, you're here to listen. If you miss a class, it's okay. Drop in, drop out. That's fine. You have the syllabus. You know what subject matter we're going to be covering. But the other surprise, and are we in the midst of doing that, Thomas? Are we recording? We are recording classes this term. It's the first time we're recording classes. So if you miss a session, it will be available. Now, will it be available the same week? Probably not. We're going to need to edit and put it together, but it will go on to our YouTube channel, correct? All right. Thank you, Thomas. And by the way, everybody, can you thank Thomas for taking care of that for us? I'm sure he's just doing it for a better grade, but that's okay. I'm willing to take that. Uh, so our course description. This is a course in the study of angels and demons. The class will explore the biblical and theological foundations for understanding the nature, roles, and implications of angels and demons as they pertain to shepherding, preaching, worship, counseling, and other dimensions of ministry. Any questions about the purpose? Any terms you'd like to find? You will have these things in order to be able to differentiate. Now, one of the, the things I want to to warn you about, caution you about, at least inform you of, is that sometimes people over-spiritualize things and sometimes they under-spiritualize things. What we want to be able to, to make sure we understand is there there's plenty of spiritual warfare going on, but like any good general in a war, our enemy, the liar and the deceiver, doesn't need to pay attention to every part of our lives. There are times he's just fine leaving us to our own fleshly desires. So we have struggles in our flesh, in the world system around us, and in the person of the enemy. And what we'll see during when we start talking about spiritual warfare is how the, the scriptures call us to respond to each of those areas. And interestingly enough, the, this, the prescription is exactly the same in all three areas. So when we talk about shepherding, we want to be able to talk about that, our worship, our counseling, other dimensions of ministry. Upon completion of the course, you should know and or be able to do the following. Uh, through participating in this class, the student will articulate the origin, nature, and roles of angels and demons as they pertain to today's world and believers. Where'd they come from? How'd they get here? What do they do? They will become conversant. They will have an understanding with the ministries of angels to God, to believers, and to the world. Angels just don't focus on one thing. They minister to God. They minister on behalf of God. They minister to you and me, and they minister to the world around us. They become conversant or familiar with the methods and strategies demons employ towards God, believers, and the world. And they will understand the scriptural basis for spiritual warfare and various positions and methodologies regarding spiritual warfare. I'll give you a quick taste on that. There are people who talk about uh, power encounters. And that's where we they do things like bind the strong man. They, they ferret out the lies. They want to know names. They want to know places. There are others who are more in, involved in prayer ministries. There are those who focus on identity in Christ ministries. Those are all different ways of coming at the, at the subject of spiritual warfare. So, uh, preview of things to come. Our objectives. We will read, reflect, and discuss assigned books and articles and address the subject matter. Uh, there are a number of books that are going to be suggested. Again, you don't have to do any of this if you're auditing the class. They are not cheap books. They are academic books. And we're teaching this course at an upper division slash uh, postgraduate uh, level. 
So I'm not going full uh, doctoral on you with all of the, the fancy words. And when I use a word that is theologically particular, I will explain it. Um, but we are teaching this at a slightly higher level. And again, if I fail to define something or haven't been clear on it, will you please, please, I beg you, stop me. I want to make sure you understand because these things tend to build on one another. And if you don't stop me and, and let, force me to explain it, then you're going to be really struggling to catch up. So I hope that is helpful to you. So we will discuss it. Uh, and there will be a final examination with a passing grade for, for our, our uh, cre for credit individuals. And I encourage you, a lot of people on our finals, um, some of you have come to classes and you see that the attendance goes way down at the final. And yet it's one of the more informative classes because it's a chance to be reminded of and test yourself against the information in the class. So what we do is we have uh, those taking it for credit to the exam. And then afterwards, we all go through the answers together and they get to see just how well they did, and we get a recap on the, the, the highlights of the course. So I encourage you, if you get the opportunity to come to all the classes, including the final. Write a paper regarding spiritual warfare and the student's position on it using scriptural principles and passages, as well as research material on the basis of the student's position. So there'll be a paper coming, and uh, Thomas, what, what do they call it when I grade a paper? I, I employ the red pen of death. And uh, Th Thomas um, has had an interesting learning curve with the Red Pen of Death um, because he mostly focused on creative writing through his formative years. And we're, now we're doing research writing. And I remember, well, actually, Pastor John years ago said, I've got my paper, do your best. And I went, oh, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to challenge me. All right. Now I will read it with a more close, closely uh, guarded eye. And he came back and was all red. He goes, it's the red pen of death. Um, but we want our, our staff here to be well represented and well educated when it comes to spiritual matters because they are, in fact, shepherds and they need to be able to answer questions. So, yes, Susan. Is there one text of these two that you would recommend over the other just as a foundation? For yeah, of the two texts that are listen, uh, listed, uh, both are excellent. Grudem will be a little more readable. Erickson is a little more thorough. And so if you ask me what I prefer, I prefer Millard Erickson's uh, theology text. Um, and um, Millard Erickson came out of Denver Seminary. It's a fairly conservative evangelical uh, seminary. And Grudem operates out of Trinity, which is, again, an evangelical and conservative seminary. But if you were to put them on scales, uh, Grudem is a, a little more charismatic. And I don't mean that in a bad way. He is well-reasoned and well thought out, but he is a little more open to the charismatic things than, than um, Erickson is. So they're both excellent, wonderful scholars with good information. So it depends on your, if you want it more readable, Grudem, if you want more technical stuff, go Erickson, and they both, both books will cover a wide breadth of, of theology. Erickson's book is almost 1,200 pages long, if not more. Grudem's book is five, 600 pages long, and they cover 11 to 13 different areas of theology, not just angelology. So they become excellent reference books for you. Can I make a comment? You can make a comment. If you're going to take law classes through Eric or the school, they're a good investment because they're in Utah. So for those of you listening, Terry just said they're a good investment because they apply to more classes. And you would be able to go to the index and look up stuff. And maybe you, you say, wow, pastor just preached that today. I am not sure about that. That's okay. We love that we are called in Peter, first Peter, a royal priesthood. That we can go to God on our own. And you hear us on a regular basis say, don't just take my word. Feel free to check out anything I preach. It does two things. One, it causes you to grow on your own. Two, it holds us accountable. And I appreciate that. Uh, the, the other, uh, several months ago, one of the pastors uh, quoted a, a verse. He did a great job. And then he cited the wrong book. He said, you might want to change that in second service. Um, we want to be accountable. And the, one day I said something just 
I was way out of line um, or I lost count and they, they called it. So um, those of you who just had homiletics class know that every Tuesday afternoon after our staff meeting and lunch, we get together in my office as a preaching team and we review each other's sermons. So this Tuesday, Pastor Jason will be in the seat and we'll all talk about how did he present, what was his subject matter, what was his, what was his uh, body language, what were all those things. And it helps all of us to become better at preaching as we go along. So that happens every week. So you want to hold us accountable? We're all for it. We believe in it. Let's talk about those texts for a second. Miller J. Erickson, um, like I said, out of Denver Seminary uh, and other places. And then Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology. So those are two books, but there are some others. You can also find these, Amazon.com, abebooks.com. If you uh, have that or I want to underline it or highlight it, it's one of my favorite places to get used books. They come at far lesser expense most of the time. Uh, CBD.com, also, a, that's Christian Book Distributors. In case you're wondering, I'm not advocated for anything herbal. Um, so that's Christian Book Distributors. You can also put things on ebooks. And by the way, I like putting things on ebooks because then they become word searchable. So let's say I'm looking up a very technical word. Um, let's say I'm looking up the word hypostatic union. I could go to the back of the index or I can download one of the books and just type in hypostatic union and it'll pop up all the places it shows up in the theology. So now I get a chance to read through those. I love my digital Bibles. Um, things have changed so much since I started ministry. I, so when I started ministry, personal computers were first becoming a thing. I had my 8088, and if you had 20 megabytes <laughs> of storage, you were styling. It cost you $3,000 to get that computer. Um, but now, with as computers and the programs have become more, more sophisticated, I was hanging out with another pastor once. He goes, yeah, I'm having a great time parsing this Greek verb. And I looked at his desk. I said, you've got six books out. He goes, yeah, it's one of my, it was one of my favorite things to do. I said, I bet I can parse that faster than you. He goes, no, I've been doing this for years. I said, okay, let me get my laptop. Okay, let's, let's, let's pick out this word for uh, in the Greek. And he goes, okay. I said, you, just, you say when. He goes, okay, go. I said, got it. <laughs> he went, what? I said, yeah, it does the whole thing for me. And uh, so when you have, I, I encourage you, if you can partake of programs, we love recommending any number of programs. Logos Bible Software, L-O-G-O-S, Logos Bible Software is very academic. You can also build a library on uh, olivetree.com. Actually, our staff favors using that over the others. It is friendly. You can put it on your phone. You can put it on as many devices as you want. Uh, they probably have a limit somewhere, but I haven't reached it. Um, you can also go to PC Study Bible. Those are th the three major. There's there's several others as well, but they're all fantastic. and They have amazing resource tools. The nice thing about these is you can buy them in modules. So if you want an interlinear, you want to look at original languages, you can buy just that just that book or just that module. I have several probably several hundred, if not a thousand or so books on my olive tree. Um, because over the years, I acquire a module. Every time I preach on a book of the Bible, I acquire the module. So you can acquire dozens of commentaries on any one thing. So digital books, thank God, it's a, that's a positive way that the, uh, the digital age has impacted us. Um, so Thomas, at Mountain View School of Theology, we believe as do all things is under the Lord. And as a result, we hold a high academic standard of honesty. We don't tolerate plagiarism and cheating. Students found guilty and any form of academic dishonesty will face consequences. We're thinking of lashing with wet noodles. But um, so there's just they, the plagiarism explained and what we do. Uh, course methods. Throughout this course, a number of methods will be used to engage the students in learning and processing information, interacting with other students and applying the learning to their lives. They will include lecture and class discussion. So there are three ways of learning. You can learn visually. You can learn by your hearing. You can learn by doing. 
So we try and employ at least two of the three by, by both talking and by putting it up on the screen. At the end of the course, the instructor's syllabus will be available to you. All you'll have to do is re request it from the office and they will email it to you digitally so that you can have all my notes um, for yourself, digitally if you so choose. And if you choose to teach, God bless you. I think it's fantastic. Um, we also do readings out of Ericsson or Grudem or both. Um, and by the way, this that is such an interesting thing to take two different authors dealing with different subjects and realize this one deals with it at the, at the beginning of the chapter, this one deals with it at the middle, and you're trying to find the pages that deal with the subject matter. It's a lot of work. For credit, Thomas, complete the course requirements within the schedule. They include listening for each session, reading the assigned text or Bible passages, completion of a satisfactory assigned papers, and a passing grade on the final exam. That's all you got to do, just like every other class you've ever taken with me. Uh, reading. The Bible readings and references in the textbooks used in this course should be read completely at least once. I really want to encourage you. If you just want to come, sit down and listen, I, we're here. We're going we're gonna to do everything for you. But to read ahead or to be prepared will allow you, first of all, to contemplate the material. Secondly, it'll allow you to ask in questions that'll be a little more thoughtful in nature. And, and third, it'll allow us to move forward as a class. So it's very helpful to pre-read the information. Now, one of my favorite students for that is Galen. Galen not only pre-reads information, he goes and finds other sources and then challenges it. And I think that's fantastic. The other day we had a long discussion. What do we have a long discussion about? We were having fun. The Holy of Holies. Yeah, we had a good time on that. How big was it? Where was it? Why does it matter to us? We're still not really sure, but it was a fun discussion. And that's because he loves reading uh, ahead and reading other information. So feel free. My only concern is if you just Google stuff on the internet, I assure you, you could end up in serious heresy. Be careful of your resources. Be careful of where you're looking and who you're looking at. And if you have any questions, if something seems odd, please just ask. Um, how, I don't know if any of us have yet encountered, we have some folks that's in a, uh, a situation that seems to be a growing place of spiritual warfare. I don't, I don't know if any of you have been confronted yet to, to address the issue of Mother God. Hmm. You should only know him as Father. We have some folks who are going around saying, have you heard about Mother God? And it's generally these two ladies, and we've had numbers of our congregation have that encounter. They came to, to our door one day in the parking lot here? Oh, at Stater Brothers. One, somebody else received, uh, did that while at dinner going to a Padres game. They came to our house and they talked with my wife. I'm glad my wife is so sweet. That's nice. Why don't you have a good day? <laughs> and the, the scripture they use, that's, that's why I think that the classes are so important. We, have, we talk about effective Bible study here. That's one of our classes. Hermeneutics, which is advanced Bible study. We use that because they're pulling verses out of context and misusing uh, verses on a regular basis. And even some of the ones they use have really have nothing to do with the subject. So being informed is important. And I want to encourage you to always do that because there is no, God addresses himself as father. Is he got an actual gender? No, he's above, he's transcendent above that. But the idea that there's a mother God addressed in scripture is inaccurate. That is not something that scripture speaks to and certainly doesn't reinforce it. So just so you know, there's spiritual warfare out there. Um, vocabulary. I've already kind of addressed this. Throughout the course, you will find terms necessary to the understanding of the subject matter presented. You should become familiar with any unfamiliar words and their meanings as a requirement of this course. If indeed you run across a term, I have no idea what Erickson is saying when he uses that term, please highlight it and bring it to class so we can talk about it. Please, if you can't find the definition, please let me know. We will try and define it for you. Like any profession, there are lots of, of individual jargon and lingo and, and words that pertain to that particular profession. Each, each one of us has probably got a set of vocabulary that is different than everybody else's. You're just here to share mine. So for, for instance, if I go and I talk with Brian, uh, and he says, yeah, yeah, those, those are 16 on center. To another carpenter, 
That means a lot. I had to go look it up. <laughs> um, no, we, so do you mind if I and, out you, Andrea? Okay, Andrea is a counselor. And um, we have a, an ongoing relationship and I very much enjoyed getting to know her. But within the counseling realm, there's all kinds of, of uh, acronyms, there's all kinds of terminology. Um, so if we talk about, well, what kind of counselor? Oh, I'm a, I'm a CB. You're like, that's nice. Uh, is, weren't those people guys who built stuff in World War II? No, not the CBs. I'm a cognitive behavioral therapist. Um, and there are lots of different types of lingo that each and every one of us use. Uh, I only, I'm only throwing out examples of the ones I know something about, although I've learned some interesting things through Galen, who is a uh, former San Diego uh, police department, and said, yeah, um, I learned recently about choir practice. <laughs> so uh, I don't know if anybody's old enough to remember the movie The Choir Boys. It was a, it was a these cops in, in New York, and they were, why were they called choir boys? It wasn't because they were all good. It's because they went to choir practice. And choir practice for the police has been historically, although I'm hearing not as much these days, where they would gather together at police bars and they would debrief their day. You know, hey, Galen, how are you doing? Oh, I pulled over three drunk drivers and one spit in my face. And it gave them a chance to decompress. So they talked about going to choir. You're preaching to the choir. So it was one of those places where they had a place to talk to other first responders about their days and to learn that. So when somebody says, oh, yeah, I don't, I don't get to go to choir practice anymore, I think, ah, I understand what they're talking about. If there are things unique to your particular vocabulary profession, please don't hesitate to share. I love knowledge. I love learning new things. So if there's an unfamiliar word, please bring it to our attention. If there's a word you'd like to further get, get explained or expounded upon, please let us know because you will not be alone. If you are here and you have a question come to your mind, I can almost guarantee that somebody else has it in their mind. Papers and final exam. So here we go. Everybody look at Thomas now. No, you don't have to. A working position regarding spiritual warfare, write a paper five pages entitled Spiritual Warfare Principles and Practices in which you outline scriptural passages and themes which will undergird your position. Use APA or other agreed upon format. Um, that was also something Thomas got to learn. I said, Thomas, I need you to use APA. He goes, what's an APA? So it's a particular academic format. There's, there are lots of them out there. There's Chicago, there's others. Um, and one of the interesting thing is is you notice that you're saying it's just a five page paper. Well, that's, that's actually the trick of academics is to turn a significant subject into a succinct five page paper is a challenge. It's harder to write good short papers than it is to just kind of move around and meander and write long papers if you like writing. So five page paper coming up, the red pen of death awaits you. Um, and we have a rubric. Now this is new. I don't know how well you can read it. The print's not huge, but uh, paper, you get, there's the thesis, the content, the analysis and clarity and organization, the conclusion, the mechanics. Those are five different, five? Yeah, five different areas with the grading scales that you can get. This was added because of Thomas's wife, because she said, Hey, when we got out of school, we used to, we all, they always gave us a rubric. I said, when I was in school, they expect you to know how to write. <laughs> so now they've defined it for them. And I think that's actually a pretty cool thing because you can now check your paper against each of those five categories and uh, the descriptions. And that's in your syllabus, correct? Good. So feel free. And then you can evaluate other people's papers as well. How did they do? Uh, course grading requirements, 20% of your course grade is just participation. Uh, the paper is 40% and the final is 40% of the, of the course grade. So here is the subjects that we're going to cover there in your syllabus. What page are they on now? Four, thank you. So uh, we're gonna start talking with the existence of angels. Some people, and we're, we'll, we'll discover this, want to say, no, they're just, 
They're there to help us understand. They're actually metaphors. They're not real. Well, we're going to look at what scripture has to say. And you can see the reading there and the scriptures that are involved in there. We're going to debrief through those scriptures. We're going to talk about the creation of angels in session two. The nature of angels. How were they created? What do they possess? What do they not possess? For instance, some people do not grasp the idea that a, uh, our enemy, Satan, is limited. He is pro he's more powerful, more knowledgeable than any of us are. No question, not even close. But he is not omniscient. Omniscient means all-knowing. He is not all-knowing, and he's not omnipresent. Omnipresent means everywhere. God is omnipresent. God is omniscient. God is omnipotent. All-knowing, all-powerful, all-present. Satan is none of those things. And he cannot read your mind. Sometimes we think, okay, he's in my head. He's not in your head. He may use what's in your head. He may observe it. He may be able to dis discern what it is. And we'll talk about that as we get closer to the spiritual warfare section. But he has limitations. So what is the nature of angels? Uh, the reality of Satan, the creation of sin and Satan, the activities of Satan, Satan's world, the reality of demons, the nature of demons, and activities of demons. And you will notice on the, the far right, we see scripture, but we also see um, down in session 12, an article, Dr. Gary Brashears out of Portland Seminary wrote a great uh, couple of articles on spiritual warfare in appendices A and B. They should be in your syllabus. So those are the readings. You'll be able to look at those. The only thing that was not on there was the dates. And we did that because we're going to use this more than once. And frankly, I'm too lazy to write in new dates every time. That, that sounds, huh? And they, come, they change anyway. These will not change this time. And to the best of my knowledge, I should not predict the future as a prophet. But yeah, we've had that happen before. So uh, questions, comments to this point? Yes, Galen. They come from different perspectives. So within the Catholic Church, and I'm not going to go too far with this because we're going to get to it, things are more formalized. Remember, the Catholic Church not only holds the Scripture in high regard, and they're very good with the Scriptures, but they also hold the Apocrypha in high regard, which some of their spiritual activity comes out of the Apocrypha. Apocrypha is not Scripture. And the Pope speaks ex cathedra. That means the Pope speaks with, infallibly on spiritual matters. By the way, until the 1960s, the Pope spoke infallibly on all matters. So if the Pope said that the, earth, the sun, or sun revolves around the earth, as far as the Catholic Church was concerned, that was true. In the 60s, with Vatican II, the Pope moved to speaking ex cathedra on spiritual matters. And that means when the, the Pope speaks about a spiritual matter, it's on equal standing with Scripture as far as the Roman Catholic official doctrine is concerned. Um, do all Catholics take it that way? The answer is no. Just as not everybody in our church believes exactly the same things I believe. And it's okay. You go your way. I'll go God's. No, I'm just kidding. Um, if we don't have fun here, we're going to end up in serious trouble. So let's make sure we have fun here. So the teaching has has diverged because there tends to be more for formalism, more ritualistic practices, more liturgical practices. And, and when I use those terms, ritualistic means we say these prayers with these words. We do these things in this order. Liturgical means this is means you do this. This means you do this. Um, and so there, theirs is more ritualized and liturgical than most of the other schools of thought around spiritual warfare. Okay. They're trying to accomplish the same thing. Um, we look for common ground where we can, and we acknowledge differences where they exist. Great question. Okay. Scripture for today, none, none. We're not going to take time to debrief because you didn't have a chance to read ahead. And for next time, lesson one is the existence of angels. Erickson, pages 433 through 437, so it's not very long. Grudem, 397 through 41, again, not particularly long. Scripture, Genesis 6. It'd be so much fun. Genesis 6, 
the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were desirable and pleasing to the eye. So the sons of God came to the daughters of men and had children by them, Nephilim, heroes of old, heroes of renown. So we're going to be talking about Nephilim next time as well as what happened there and what does that mean? Because there are three or four competing theories about who are the sons of God, who are the daughters of men, and who are the Nephilim. I'm just going, wow. You're just going, wow, cool. And by the way, it has nothing, nothing to do with the Russell Crowe movie about Noah. Nothing. That came out of a non-scriptural book called the Book of Enoch, just so you know. If you read the book of, don't, I, by the way, why did I say that? Don't read the book of Enoch. It's not worth your while. I had to read it because it's part of what I do. And um, I saw the movie and I went, oh, that's where they got that idea because that is a stupid idea. Um, we'll look at Job, just a couple of verses there where he refers to angels, sons of God. And that is all for the introduction today. Questions or comments before we wrap it up? I, I tried to explain to everybody it's going to be a very short session. We'll jump in next time. We will be between one and a half and two hours most sessions. Nadia? Having read the 13 dates and there are 14 topics. Right? I thought I had it all organized right. We'll find out. Before next Sunday, you mean? Maybe by email. Maybe you can send us a Correct. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have the office produce them. And if you want them by email, let the office know. By email. Can I get them by email? Mm -hmm. cool. Yep. And I will make sure that they are aware that I said it was just fine to ma mail out student copies. Every once in a while, they email out the, the instructor's copy and somebody starts asking questions like, where did that come from? Okay. We don't spill the beans till the end. Other questions? Peter? Can I pop by the office and get a hard copy? Yeah, they'll print one up for you. All right, thank you. Yep, La Monica or Wendy or Alyssa, whoever's there, cool. take care of it. They all know about it. Susan? So if I just donated to the commentary um, and I want reference books, probably the best investment would be the two books? Yep. Okay, as a starting point. As a starting point. Um, also, I encourage you, our church library has um, commentaries. And if you come up empty there, just come to my office. I'll make sure you get some. Okay. So before I engaged in going strictly digital, I had, like most pastors, acquired lots of books. It was kind of interesting when I first came to Mountain View. I uh, had embraced the digital stuff, and I left about four or 5,000 books at my house in Oregon. And down here, I only brought one or 2,000. Um, but it used to be the pastors used to show off by having books all around their shelves, which they hardly ever opened. Um, I keep the ones I open digitally and don't worry about the rest. But I have at least four commentary sets on my shelves, if you don't find them in the library. Yeah, isn't that sad? I only show off where I've traveled to. <laughs> if you happen to come into my office, you'll see walls of memorabilia and stuff. and. Each one of them has a story that reminds me of fond memories, so I enjoy those. And a, and a wall of weapons. Knives, tomahawks, boomerangs. He's not going to tell you where he uses them. <laughs> or on whom. Yes. That's right. Any other questions? Any other pertinent questions? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time today, and we will meet again in two weeks, and we will have some... Um, extra syllabi and uh, lobby next week. So I would love to pray with you and uh, release you. Father, thank you for time together, for the blessings and the questions asked, and also for the adventure that we have in front of us. Help us to be good students of the word and to live it out in ways that demonstrate that you are our God and you are more powerful than anything in this world. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. Have a great couple of weeks.